respectfully acknowledge that this land is Treaty 6 land. Treaty 6 is a traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Soto, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others whose history, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant communities. Welcome to worship. I'm the Reverend Dr. Catherine Faith McLean. Behind me is a playground. Beside me is a pollinating garden. Children, the natural world around us, the intertwining of our natural resources, particularly today we think about the corn and the squash and the bean. Welcome to this time of worship. This pollinating garden has been planted with native plants, things that are indigenous to the area, and the purpose is that they will draw bees and hummingbirds and butterflies and beetles. All of these things to do what they're supposed to do, what they're intended to do. From the Psalms, more desired are they to be go than gold. More desired are they to be than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, sweeter than honey, and drippings of the honeycomb. These are the ways of God, the decrees of God that make the simple wise, the commandments of God that enlighten our eyes, the reverence of God, the reverence of God that is pure and enduring forever. More desired are these things about the presence of God and our participation in God's world. Even than gold, than much fine gold, sweeter are they even than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. I'm going to show you some of these plants. So welcome to this time together. We at St. Paul's United Church in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada are very glad that you are with us. You can see these little buzzing ones, can't you? Doing their work, doing their work. There's one, do you see it tucked up where the yellow meets the green? Doing its work, doing its work. For the beauty of the earth, for the glory of the skies, for the love which from our birth over and around us lies. of the several community gardens in the city of Edmonton. People around here for the most part live in apartment buildings and throughout this garden there are marigolds and sunflowers, sweet peas, beets, carrots, tomatoes, squash. It's been a dry summer and nonetheless, the plots have been tended. Some of the tomatoes look absolutely perfect. I hope they get harvested this evening. This is a communal effort to share the property, to look after the gardens. 
We're thinking today about how we are interconnected, intertwined, if you like, as part of this great creation. R. W. Hoekstra is bringing the teaching of the three sisters. Susan Farrell, Tyson Kerr, our musicians are bringing you music. Perhaps you sing along. Coming up this week, Thursday, September 30, is Orange Shirt Day. Phyllis Jack Webstead was taken from her family to a residential school. And on the first day of school, Phyllis wore an orange shirt given to her by her grandmother. It was taken away from her immediately. And the long time of her separation from family began. This separation from community was imposed by church and state. On Orange Shirt Day, you're welcome to wear something orange, a t-shirt perhaps. I understand that there's a bit of a run on t-shirts. They're hard to come by right now. So a sweater, a scarf, a jacket, a shirt, something orange on that day as a symbol. Symbols are strong, aren't they? Symbols are stronger than words sometimes. Something orange on the 30th. 30th of September, Orange Shirt Day, is now, as of this June, a federal statutory holiday, the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Government offices are closed, a lot of church offices are closed, to give an opportunity for, for thought, for consideration, and for action, for figuring out how we make a difference, how we, how we make a change. This National Day of Acknowledgement of Recognition, this National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, is a response to the TRC and in particular to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's Call to Action Number 80. Call to Action Number 80 called on the federal government in collaboration with First Nations people to offer a holiday, to establish a holiday, a day apart from work, to commemorate the history and the legacy of the residential schools, an opportunity to ruminate, to consider, and also a time for action a time to remember the survivors, their communities, their families, to acknowledge the long arc of harm, of distress, to recognize that we are all part of this together. We are intertwined. I'm bringing you a prayer. This prayer is written by the Reverend Catherine Tamara Stewart. Catherine says she wrote this prayer as a recognition that children and youth, like, like adults, feel that reconciliation needs to happen in our communities and acknowledge that it is not an easy way forward. She goes on to say, sometimes we don't get it right, but Creator is with us, loving and holding us, giving us courage to keep working for love, peace, and justice among people and for all of creation. And so it is, it is, so it is that we find ourselves in this season of creation, considering how we are intertwined, how we are connected. I bring you the prayer Catherine Stewart wrote. God, we try to love your world as you would have us do, to see all of creation as good and sacred, too. Sometimes our view gets clouded and we lose our way. Help us to say we're sorry and to mean what we say. 
Let Jesus be our leader so that we might know your heart, so that your spirit brings us courage to work together, not apart. Again, God, we try to love your world as you would have us do, to see all of creation as good and sacred too. Sometimes our view gets clouded and we lose our way. Help us to say we're sorry and to mean what we say. Let Jesus be our leader so that we might know your heart, so that your spirit brings us courage to work together, not apart. Amen. Good morning. Corn, or naste. The beans, or saheta. And the squashes, or pumpkins, gano osera wanan. These together in the Mohawk Iroquois Confederacy of Six Nations are what is known as our three sisters. It's not so much a fable as it is uh, about another teaching, a teaching of uh, interweaving, a teaching of looking after one another. It's a teaching of uh, that we carry that is of uh, Creator's original given laws to us, which are good laws, which is a good thing to be. And as we will hear this morning in a little bit, from Psalm 19, verse 7 through 14, the first seven is, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise this, the simple. There is a lot that we wonder about sometimes, and especially for those, of course, that uh, are not familiar with uh, um, our teachings. And, uh, but I think somewhere along the line, we have all at various times on our travels globally, it's not just only here, that we speak of the three sisters. And again, from the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, these are the three sisters. Who are they? Who were they? When the first daughter of Sky Woman, original woman, died, she was buried in the new earth, which was Skatnekwe, creation here on Turtle Island. From within that soil grew, came up to be the three sisters. So the first sister, which is known as the corn, she was very tall, strong. She uh, could kind of, at times, as we know, overlook over all of the other uh, growth. Beautiful long blonde hair that she always carried and that was always blowing in the winds. And she was dressed in a green shawl so she could dance in the gentle winds always. There was another sister which had uh, often a bright yellow frock, tendency to frolic off by herself which are the beans. And, but she had the strength to uphold her tallest sister with her twines so that in the strong winds, the tall sister would not become weak and fall over. That was the creation story that Creator gave the responsibility to that sister of the beans. And then the third, third sister, dressed in green, she could only crawl along the ground. 
she had prickly skin because it was to uh, keep away the, uh, the bugs and the wild animals. And so we know the squashes and the pumpkins, what we refer to as that third sister. And when we know some of the squashes, they have rough skin. Some of them are uh, very prickly and, uh, and so, and her green leaves, her responsibility was to keep the ground moist so that in hot weathers, um, there would be enough of the moisture to help each of them flourish. They have a drink of that water um, that gives life. Together, they looked after one another. So you could say that uh, the oldest sister, the tallest sister, was the strong one. When we look, I think, in our family dynamics, and especially for those families that do have three sisters in the family, sometimes we can look at it in a little bit of a different way. That oldest sister, or not, pardon me, not the oldest sister, but the strongest, tallest sister maybe, she might have the strength. She will have the strength to look over the younger ones. She will have the strength to uh, be tall and strong, and in a moment of crisis, she might be the one that will step up to the plate first and foremost. We have the playful sister, very much with a mind of her own, um, and, and yet she will always come to the help of her older sister regardless of what, which is part of the intertwining of, you know, as the beans grow and intertwine around the corn stalks. And then we have the younger sister, kind of the one who is the quiet one. She's the one that kind of um, is there, but not quite there. She doesn't um, put herself out front. But in all truth, she might be the one that is actually the very foundation that the middle sister and the tallest sister live on. For she keeps things protected. She keeps the other two sisters nurtured by her quiet demeanor. Of course, this, although a teaching, they're not real people as in human form as we are today. It's not about just cooperation and support. It's not just about something to talk about, a fable to tell around the sacred fires. But it also outlines the traditional crop growing techniques that originate with the Haudenosaunee. It is a very much also that as the corn is planted on the Mount of Earth in the center, surrounded by the beans, and then anchored with the squash. It provides a structure. It provides a structure for the beans to climb, give shade to the plants beneath. And the beans feed the soil nitrogen to help the plants grow, and the squash shields the roots to prevent weeds from growing. It also, of course, helps the soil to retain the moisture and its prickly leaves deterring the pests. As a few weeks ago, I was able to bring you another part of interweaving that we cannot stand alone, even though sometimes we like to think as individual humans that we really don't need anyone else because we can do it all alone, but we cannot. The three sisters, you will find them all around the globe in the different forms of storytelling with all indigenous folk. In many lodges and houses and places where indigenous folk live, you will always find the corn. One of my first three sisters that I received from my very first elder, Carlene Elliott, in 1991, were these three. They're tied together, and they're always at the door, on my door, my front door, wherever I have lived. 
ideally, because I'm in an apartment, uh, small building here, they're not on the outside of the door, but on my inside door, on the front door today. It also has a teaching with that, as long as it's corn around everywhere. It is a place that indicates to our spirits of our ancestors, of our little people, that it's a safe place for them to come and rest or play, to feed and to drink, a drink of water. It's a place that they know that it's kind of a traditional home, that they won't get lost when those spirits come and travel with us or just come to rest. And that a huge teaching around the globe, I think, with indigenous folk, with the corn also is that when you have lots of corn around in your house, that household will not go hungry. It is also the strength, as we know. It is the strength, as is the braids of our sweet grass, it is the very much the teaching also of the five arrows of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. When they're individual, they could break. The First Nations would be warring with each other, and there would be no good would come out of it. But bound together, it's unbreakable. The interweaving, I think, too, that speaks of the verse of Psalm 7 that we will hear in a little while, 7 through 14, of original creator given laws. There was a reason for that. And I think, especially in this day and age, we must get back more to creator given laws in our daily lives, consciously, than we have for a very long time. Yeah, I will. We are in the middle of the University of Alberta campus, the Hub Mall to one side, Rutherford Library to the other side. Here on campus, I, I want to tell you some good news. Oliver Rossier called me this week. Many of you know Oliver. Oliver works at the University of Alberta and he said, Catherine, there's something I want to tell you about and it might be that people at St. Paul's and beyond have a way of lifting this up into the wider world. When he told me about it, I said, Oliver, you have given me an instance, a significant, strong, and remarkable instance of real hope happening in our world. Oliver told me about the Institute of Prairie and Indigenous Archaeology the Institute of Prairie and Indigenous Archaeology. It's the only named institute for Indigenous archaeology in the world. The director is Dr. Kishna Supernant. She is leading her team in working with communities in this area and beyond with regard to archaeology and with regard to our shared heritage, our intertwined lives as people who live in Treaty 6. The Institute of Prairie and Indigenous Archaeology has expertise in using various remote sensing technologies. 
these can be used in burial contexts across our prairie provinces. The technologies are non-invasive. They're designed to show possible locations where graves may have been dug into the soil, but there is no excavation, no ground disturbance, no big shovels and backhoes showing up. It's done with grace and with respect. 30 bands have been in touch with the Institute of Prairie and Indigenous Archaeology to request help looking for unmarked graves. My remark about shovels and backhoes is that perhaps anyone could do the work with a shovel or a, a backhoe, but because of the sensitivity because of the connections, because of the human connection, because of the history, because of our intertwined history. Being able to do it with cultural sensitivity, with grace, is essential. And so the researchers who are working through the Institute of Prairie and Indigenous Archaeology are prepared to work with the communities, to be helpful and respectful and they're aware of the layered, the layered responses we have in dealing with these delicate conversations. The discovery of the unmarked graves has brought a great deal of distress right across the country and globally for certain. Knowing that there are researchers who bring this sensitivity as well as the expertise to the work It's very heartening. It's very heartening. There may be ways that we at St. Paul's are able to make connections or lift up this work, support it in a variety of ways. And I bring it to you because what we're doing in Truth and Reconciliation is not simply words. It's not simply even the marking of time. It's real work respected relationships, compassion. Here inside Habmo, we find the Institute of Prairie and Indigenous Archaeology. You may be a student on campus or a member of faculty or staff. You might wish to call them up. Hop in, have a look. God weeps at love withheld, at strength misused, at children's innocence abused, and till we change the way we love God we Psalm 19, verses 7 through 14. The law of God is perfect, reviving the soul. The law of God is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of God are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of God are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of God is clear, enlightening the eyes, the reverence for God is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of God are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can detect their errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Who can detect their errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from the insolent. Do not let them have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O oh God, my rock and my redeemer. 
I'm going to sit on this rock for a moment of reflection. The law of God is perfect, reviving the soul. The commandment of God is clear, enlightening the eyes. Oh, Psalm 19 can be uplifting. And here's the, here's the thing. What is the commandment? It's to love our neighbor, isn't it? The commandment is to love our neighbor. And so the commandment is clear, enlightening our eyes. And the reverence of, for God is pure. The law of God is perfect. The precepts of God are right. This beautiful psalm. And then, and then, and then, and then, and then. Who can detect their errors? Clear me from hidden faults. As religious people, it is and has been and will be easy to get stuck in what we think is right, in what seems to be the way that is going to make things better. And sometimes it's wrong, isn't it? And we need to acknowledge the hubris, the pride that is part of those religious traditions. If we If we think of God as our rock, a rock and redeemer, that which is under our feet, perhaps under us as we're sitting and reflecting and contemplating, then we need, we have opportunity. We're called to reflect on our hubris. And I offer you that that is part of what we are doing in our reflection as religious people, as United Church of Canada people, as Christians, as people who have this as our heritage, that we are reflecting on the hubris of our people, the pride, the understandings that were thought to be right, but that were wrong. And so we have the Graham Mall and John Bell piece. There is a place prepared for little children, those we once lived for, those we deeply mourn. Those who from play, from learning and from laughter, cruelly were torn. We acknowledge this. And on orange shirt day as we wear something orange, on the national day for truth and reconciliation, we pause, we reflect, we think, we acknowledge that the ordinances of God are sweet as honey, more to be desired, more to be desired than fine gold, sweeter than honey dripping from the honeycomb. And we got it wrong. And in our reflection, We're figuring out ways to intertwine, to learn our connections, to be siblings, sisters and brothers in this treaty land.
So let's pray. Right here on campus in the mix of it all, oh Holy One, we pray. We pray in this early season of autumn, after the equinox, as things shift, as the natural world carries us through these warm days into the autumn, we pray in this shifting time of relationships where we strive to learn, to remember, to listen to the stories, to absorb the teachings. And we're grateful for those who speak. We're grateful for time to listen. Guide us, Holy One, each of us, with the sweetness of honey and the drippings of the honeycomb, guide us into the sweetness of these days where we may share love and live compassion and be the hand of generosity and be the listening ears and be those who support thoughtful action. Ah, we pray this with our own personal prayers in our hearts and burdening our shoulders, prayers for those we love who are ill, who are frightened, who are moving from the season of great life toward the season of gentle rest, life beyond life. We pray for those who are home from school because of COVID outbreaks. We pray for the teachers the administrators, the parents, the guardians, the grandparents, who become the guide and the rock in the midst of all the uncertainty and who themselves need a rock somewhere to stand, somewhere to sit, to take in the change in season, to absorb the intertwining of our lives, to walk with inspiration and courage. And in the beauty of this moment, we offer silence for our own thoughtful prayers. In the name of all that is holy, amen. God weeps at love withheld, at strength misused, at children's innocence abused, and till we change the way we love God we God waits for stones to melt, for peace to seed, for hearts to hold each other's need, and till we understand the Christ, God waits. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. sweetness of the honey, God bless you. The crunch of the corn, God bless you. The flavor of the butter in the squash, God bless you. The nutrition of the beans, God bless you. The intertwining of our communities, God bless you. The interconnectedness of our peoples, God bless you. The wonder of this day, the change of the season, God bless you. God loves you. We're glad you've been with us for this time of worship. May the Spirit move. Amen. May God bless you and keep you. May God make their face to smile upon you. Keep you. May God shine their home.